Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the fourth youth forum of the school year. I'm Sam Lehman, a junior at Shaker Arts High School and a member of the City Club of Cleveland's Youth Forum Council. I'm pleased to introduce today's forum, a conversation with journalist, author, and critic Evan Narcisse. One year ago, in February of 2018, Black Panther, one of the latest superhero movies from Disney and Marvel Studios, was released in theaters. Its earnings reached $1.3 billion globally, and the film was nominated for more than 200 awards, winning 82, including three Academy Awards. However, the story of Wakanda began far before the film as a series of comics debuting in 1961 in Marvel Comics Fantastic Four number 52. Introduced amidst the civil rights movement, it, is not, it not only brought forth a superhero with supernatural strength, agility, and intelligence, but it brought a representation into the world of mainstream comics, which often lacked racial diversity, both in the characters and the writers who create them. Today we'll hear from Evan Narcissus, one of the authors who have recently continued the story of Black Panther off-screen through a new graphic novel with Marvel's comics. Co-written with two-time club speaker ta Coates, Rise of the Black Panther was released a month before the film and details the first year of the Black Panther, T'Challa, as King of Wakanda. Mr. Narcissus has said that T'Challa is his favorite superhero. <laughs> Evan Narcissus is a journalist and critic who writes about video games, comic books, movies, and TV, often focusing on the intersection of blackness and pop culture. He's a senior staff writer at io9, having previously written for The Atlantic, Time Magazine, and Kotaku. He's taught a course on video game journalism at New York University and appears as an expert guest on CNN and NPR. A native New Yorker, he now lives in Austin, Texas. He'll be in a conversation with former City Club, with former Youth Forum Council President Tiolu Orosenya, now a student at the University of Pittsburgh. Please join me in welcoming Arvind Narcissus and Tiolu Orosenya. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you, Sam, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and thank you to Mr. Narcissus for joining us. Thank you for having me. I didn't know there was going to be that, that whole bell thing. You all didn't warn me about <laughs> <City> that. <Club. laughs> um, so where did this journey start for you? Where did your love of comics come from? Uh, man, I learned to read on comics. Uh, I, I, my first memories of uh, learning to read and, and, and <coughs> probably go back to like when I was five years old and reading, reading superhero comics. Mm -hmm. um, it's where I got, uh, you know, fascinated with um, the idea of uh, fantastic fiction, you know, um, things that are larger than life. Uh, and, you know, I, I became an avid reader um, because of those early experiences. So, yeah, like that, you know, I, from, from a very young vantage point, that's where it started for me. Okay. And, you know, I, I obviously got into reading non-illustrated stories um, um, and, and work as I progressed through school, but it, it, it definitely started as a kid who loved to read comics, yeah. Was Rise of the Black Panther the first work that you've done, like, professionally, for sale, that kind of thing? Uh, yeah, it's my first creative fiction writing, yeah. So I've worked as a journalist before, um, um, writing cultural critique about, you know, the stuff Sam mentioned, comics, movies, video games, TV mm -hmm. shows. But this is the first thing where I had to write fiction, and it was kind of daunting in that regard. Right. Yeah. That's quite the successful first uh, step into the world of comics, though. Yes, <laughs> uh, I, I got I got lucky. My friends always make fun of me when I say I get lucky. It's like you, you you didn't get lucky. You didn't just get lucky. You know, I was ready. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was I was preparing myself for this the whole time. I was um, doing cultural critique and journalism. But you know, it's not, it's not every day that Marvel sends you an email says right. what's up. Yeah. <laughs> um, so from your perspective, uh, as with your history in the industry, do you think that Black Panther has helped to diversify like, the demographics that are usually interested in comics, or the stereotype that we have? 
of the yeah, day? Yeah, you know, I grew up under that stereotype. You know, when I was y'all's age, I'm assuming high schoolers, right, 14 through 18, maybe a little bit younger, maybe a little bit older, but uh, it wasn't cool to be into this nerd stuff. It wasn't cool to be into superheroes and video games and whatnot. Um, uh, so the, the, the context has definitely changed, um, but some of those same problems persist. Um, largely the creative core of people who make uh, this kind of fiction um, are, are, are white and, and uh, cis-hetero. Um, and, um, you know, fighting for a wider kind of spectrum of, of representation still continues to be like a really charged issue. It can be a hot button issue. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, Sam Wilson, who's the Falcon, um, um, you guys probably know him from the movies, but he's a long-standing Marvel character. He, be, he took on the mantle of Captain America. Steve Rogers couldn't do the Captain America thing anymore, so Captain America was essentially a black guy, and people got all up in arms. Um, they did similar things with uh, Thor. Uh, a woman uh, became, uh, became worthy of lifting me all near Thor's hammer, and there was a lot of negative fan reaction from certain, certain sectors, and you know, uh, it, it, it's a sad thing because these stories, as who saw Spider Verse? I, <laughs> I want to see more. That movie's amazing, y'all. You need to see it. I need to see more hands. It's out on digital this week. They're not paying me. Go see the movie. Um, but one of the themes, one of the themes of the movie is anybody can be a superhero. So um, it's weird to see parts of the fandom um, kind of clinging to these uh, legacy iterations of these characters. You know, like only Steve Rogers can be Captain America. Well, guess what? Steve Rogers himself would not say that. <laughs> Steve Rogers would be like, here's my boy, Sam. He's going to be Captain America for a little bit. Y'all be nice to him. Um, so it's, it's, it's a weird clash between the ethos in the comics and the behaviors in the real world. Um, yeah. <laughs> Oh, let's turn to the audience for a second. So by a show of hands, how many um, of you know of any other black superheroes than Black Panther? Oh, wow. OK. That's lower than I was expecting. So maybe 10%. Um, and then how many of you knew of Black Panther before the movie? OK, that's much better, much better. Um, so there's no shortage of black superheroes. There's Falcon, there's Storm, there's Black Lightning. Yeah. Um, Luke Cage, for instance, even yeah. got like a TV series for two seasons. Yep. So what about this specific character made him so popular and made the movie work? I can speak from like a personal perspective, perspective yeah. which I also think is something that speaks to his broader appeal. For me, when I first started reading comics with black characters in them, it was characters like Luke Cage and Black Lightning. And uh, those were uh, created and often written and edited by well-meaning white uh, writers and editors. But because they were created in a reaction to the black exploitation film movement of the 19, late 60s and 70s, uh, there was an emphasis on like um, ghetto affectation, right? Like slang and hot-tempered and. A very it was very stereotypical kind of portrayals of, of blackness. And I was like, I didn't, I didn't recognize myself in that. I don't talk like this. I don't have a temper like that. Um, I'm not angry all the time. Uh, so um, it was hard for me to see myself in those characters. But when I encountered Black Panther, when I encountered T'Challa, I'm like, he's from somewhere else. My parents are immigrants. Um, uh, his He's got like above average intelligence, um, and he spe and he and he speaks in a way that isn't um, a caricature. And I was like, I can relate to this. So I think that's one of the reasons that he is always looked at in a different way than some of the other black uh, superhero characters. And I think you know the idea of him being a king and the idea of Wakanda being uh, a secret land has this mystery and um, um, depth that uh, kind of seems to pull you in. That's, and I, I think that's probably why they, they decided to make uh, a solo movie around him. There's a lot of um, conceptual richness mm -hmm. to, to the history of the character. 
That's true. Uh, you touched on this a little bit, but comics aren't usually like seen as political fodder, but yeah. uh, Black Panther definitely touched on some interesting themes of like anti-colonialism, Black pride, African pride. Um, do you think going forward, like more writers will be more willing to touch on those touchy political issues, or do you think like the backlash will make them pull back a little no, more? No, no. I mean, I think <clears throat> you know one of the things about superhero comics is that this this that type of ambition and that type of purposefulness has always been an undercurrent to um, superhero comics. If you look at the early adventures of a Superman back in like the 1930s, late 1930s, early 1940s, he was like an anti-corruption dude, you know? Like the, I think in the first issue of Action Comics where he makes his first appearance, um, he's like hanging a corrupt senator off a power line. He's like, this is, uh, he's like, you know, you better pass the laws the right way or else, you, you know, I might slip and drop you. Um, and and uh, there, was a, there was a guy beating his wife and, and Superman busting their doors like, you're, you know, you're not, you're not gonna do this anymore. So. You know, this idea, which has become a shorthand and, and a derisive term of a social justice warrior, but like Superman was a social justice warrior. It's like people who couldn't fight for themselves, he fought for them. Um, so that stuff has always been in comics. Um, you know, and as it relates to Black Panther, <coughs> you know, there's this weird tension because the character's creators, uh, Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, were two middle-aged Jewish guys from, yeah. from uh, New York City. But they create this, you know, this this fictional African country, and I think it speaks to this universal desire <clears throat> for a homeland, you know, uh, um, and you know they are part of a diaspora themselves, uh, a, a disconnected from a history um, um, that they didn't have a direct connection to, and so I think there's some commonalities there, which may have been either either conscious or subconscious, intentional or not, um, that resonated with 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 the character. So. Political themes have always been part of comics. Um, you know, these, these characters um, fight against injustice. Um, so I think it's silly to, to think that they don't, they don't um, have a place in speaking to those things. Uh, you know, as it relates to Black Panther specifically, I feel like there's a really unique thing about him where he's kind of an anti-colonialist superhero. You know, like I always talk about superheroes are aspirational figures, right? They can talk about what's best. Um, in humanity, what's worse about humanity um, for the villains, and you know the complexities of, of how people treat each other, um, and you can boil down you know the, the the most enduring superhero characters to these 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 core nuggets, right? Like Superman's the ultimate immigrant story. He comes from a place other than Earth. He gets adopted by human beings and then grows up to represent the best in humanity. Batman's a character that suffers through trauma. And, and, and grows through pain and ultimately doesn't want anybody else to suffer the way he did. Um, and I think with T'Challa, you know, he is, uh, comes from a, a, a fantasy place, a notional space of um, resisting colonialism and, and white supremacy and, and maintaining your own um, agency, the ability to chart your own path in a world where people think you are lesser than them. And I think that's something that uh, has always been the subtext of, of uh, Black Panther comics. And in the, in the 90s, I think it became the actual text. It became the thing that creators were concerned about using this character as a vessel to speak to that, to that um, purpose. So do you find it, um, in working with Marvel and in writing these, have you felt any pressure to say certain things or do certain things? Because I know that in um, Black Panther's history that the superhero was introduced a few months before the Black Panther Party right. came That's into right. power and they changed the name yeah, um, um, somewhere for some time. Within the first, I think, 10 years of the character's appearance, I don't remember the exact date, but they started calling him the Black Leopard. Yeah. And they actually addressed it in the comics. It's like, oh, this is not a good look, Marvel. Um, but you know they were concerned about being about being adjacent to what was then perceived as a radical political movement um, embodied by the Black Panther Party. Um, so they're like, yeah, we don't have anything to do with them. It's just a coincidence. Um, uh, ultimately, that name did not name change did not stick. Thank yeah. God, because uh, Black Panther just sounds so much cooler um, than Black Leopard. Um, but yeah, um, I didn't I didn't get any kind of. Uh, um, you know, pushback or concern like that. They let me write what I want to write. Mm -hmm. And there's political subtext in it, um, which I don't uh, shy away from. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, I pretty much got to do what I want to do. Oh, that's good. 
Um, so last year was a year full of very diverse casts. We started out with Black Panther. Yeah. There was Ocean's 8 with the mostly female cast. Yep. Uh, there was Crazy Rich Asians in August. Yeah. Um, and going into this project with the intention, knowing that the movie was coming with um, a majority minority cast, yeah. did you feel that, or working with anyone else, did you feel that there was something to prove? I mean, yeah. Uh, it was my first comic, so I had a lot to prove. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I've been a, a journalist and a cultural critic for a long time, and you know, I've written about video games where I'm like, really, we 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 can't have a lead character, a lead black character in video games, or like for my entire life. You know, there's, there's been a few, but it's not been a lot. Mm. And representation has always been a concern of mine, right? So I, what, now that I finally got the chance to touch some characters that meant so much to me, and to, you know, walk the walk I've been talking about, you know. Like, okay, Mr. Critic, here's your chance to write some black characters. Um, I wanted to do, you know, what I could to have them be um, nuanced and um, three-dimensional and, you know, hopefully a little bit surprising. I wanted to, you know, write characters that felt like people I knew or felt like um, uh, characters and ideas that um, I'd been thinking about for, for a long time and have that be present in the work. You know, um, in the first issue of the series, um, we meet T'Challa's birth mother, um, who, in, who was, had been only mentioned in name in the comics. And I was thinking about, okay, well, what can I do with this character who's kind of been like an empty vessel um, to, to push this idea of better representation forward? And so, one of the things I did was I made her a scientist. You know, T'Challa's a, he's a warrior, but he's also a scientist. And we knew his dad was like the politician, the king, the warrior, but we never knew anything about his dad uh, having any scientific aptitude. So like in, in thinking about nature versus nurture, I made his mom the scientist. I was like, okay, he gets his smarts from his mom. Um, and you know, I feel very proud about that. Like, you know, she was the one, he's, he's like, I need you to be my queen because really you're smart and you can help this country do, you know, advance in a certain way. And she's like, I'm not sure, you know, you're like a king and whatnot, I'm not really down with that. Um, uh, but you know, eventually, they, they, of course, they wind up together and have T'Challa as a son. But you know, I was thinking about, okay, what kind of, you know, how do I want to treat, how do I want to treat the female characters in this book and, and, and um, you know, kind of advance the idea of a fuller representation of black humanity. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the ways you know, I was able to do it. Do you think the movie's success, um, being nominated for so many awards, being the first superhero film actually nominated for a Best Picture award, what does that say to like the wider entertainment industry about um, the versatility of comics and moving them into those live action spaces? Um, I think one of the things it says is stop being scared. Um, you know, you can take these risks on um, productions that are anchored by uh, black folks and, and, and non-white folks, um, people from marginalized communities at, in the creative decision-making positions. Um, you know, Ryan Coogler staffed his production a particular way because, you know, he wanted uh, different points of view um, to help build out that, that version of Wakanda. You know, Hannah Beachler is a production designer and, um, you know, she brings a certain um, take to what that world looks like. Ruth Carter is a costume designer, and you know, so much of that movie lives in details and the costumes and the different tribes, and she drew all that from actual African history um, from all over the continent. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if it was uh, people who didn't have that purposefulness in mind, the movie probably wouldn't have been as good, you know, because that, that, that idea that there's friction inside. Wakanda, which is a supposedly perfect country, a near utopia, but really everybody doesn't always get along. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of that is communicated in the costuming, in the set design, you know, and, and, and that's because Ryan Coogler decides to staff his production a certain way. That's a risk, you know. Um, um, some of these people had never worked on a production of that scale before. Mm -hmm. um, I actually interviewed Ruth Carter for a piece that's coming out for Time Magazine, um, and she's like, yeah, you know, the, the, the scale of it was challenging, but you know, when you realize what happens as a result of that, of operating at that scale, um, um, and thankfully they ha had a success, but that just shows 
people from all walks of life can do this work. Um, so I think, you know, if I want anything to happen in the post-Black Panther moment, it's that, that to become a reality, that to become common, where, you know, Jordan Peele, you know, making a movie and having it be a success is not an anomaly anymore. It's, it's you know, it's, it's not a story of like, hey, look, this, is, this happens so infrequently. Um, um, hopefully it'll be the opposite, that it happens so frequently as to be mundane. Uh, Tana Tanahasi Coates, excuse me, himself a two-time guest here at the City Club, um, was you got the name right. Go yeah, <laughs> was your partner in um, writing some of these comics, and um, but it's a genre very different from what we think yeah. of him compared to his book Between the World and Me. Um, going forward, but it seems to be very successful. So going forward, do you see more partnerships between, um, I guess, more socially focused authors and things like comics? Um, and entertainment movies where we don't usually think of yeah, issues no, like that. I see where you're going. It's, it's a just a natural fit, right? You know, one of the things, I mean, he's my boy, so I'm a little bit biased, but one of the things I think, one of the reasons I think ta is a good comic book writer is he's, he's used to thinking about things in a symbolic way. Um, mm -hmm. We would talk about writing comics um, when he first started this gig, and then when I, when I um, got this assignment, and the hardest thing about writing comics is thinking visually. You know, you have to freeze a moment and be like, okay, you, a comic is not a movie where you can, you can watch, in a movie you can watch somebody walk from this end of the stage to that end of the stage um, in a continuous motion, right? In a comic, you have to freeze that frame where you're like, okay, at what point, you know, if you show him take step one, two, three, four, if he has short legs, um, that's four panels and that's a waste of space, right? Um, um, you have to pick one panel and then you have to stop it and show him saying or doing something dramatic that, that, that f continues to flow from what happened before to what happens after. And it's a very specific skill. Um, and you have to think visually. Uh, uh, and you have to write a script so that an artist is actually interested in drawing it, right? If you write something boring that's just a bunch of talking heads on page after page, you'll be like, I really can't get excited for this at all. Um, so I think you know, there is a learning curve. There was a learning curve for him, for me. Even though I'd read comics, you know, we both read comics our entire lives. When you actually have to sit down and do it, it's a totally different thing. Um, that said, you know, you have Eve Ewing, who's writing um, Iron Heart for Marvel, um, which is, features a character named Rhea Williams, if y'all don't know, who's a um, young black woman who's a, a genius. Uh, she goes to MIT at 15 years old. She's basically like uh, t Tony Stark's um, protege, uh, um, and she builds her own suit of armor. Um, Eve is a, a, um, an educator. She's worked in the Chicago school system. Um, she's a poet, uh, and you know this is her first comics work. But I think she wrote a sequence in Ironheart that I feel like only she could write that, you know, because of her um, proximity to youth culture and um, growing up in Chicago and knowing what it's like to be an exceptional person in an environment where people don't necessarily uh, trust you or want you there. Um, she was able to, able to bring all those textures to the comic. And she, cause she's somebody from outside of comics, but you know, like people who read and participate in comics culture is a far broader spectrum than, again, the stereotypes we've been delivered over the years. So yeah, I think it's, it's you know, people who, who think about um, cultural production and societal norms and, 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 chain, and, and politics and movements um, throughout history are, are great fits to write for comics because, you know, comics can encapsulate a whole fictional history in 20 pages. Um, and, you, you know, I, I, had, I got to write an entire history of three generations of Black Panther characters in, in a single issue of the comic. It was hard, but, you know, I think you know, being kind of interested in how culture gets transmitted from generation to generation uh, was something that enabled me to find my way in. Um, so, besides Black Panther, who is your favorite superhero character and why? <laughs> um, hmm. It varies often. What's today? Tuesday. Um, uh, so, Daredevil is up there. I love that character. I think, you know, his super senses like enable you to write about experiencing the world in a different way. I love that. Um, people say he's corny, but I'm a big Superman fan. I think you write him the right, the right way, and he's really cool. Mm -hmm. He's somebody 
who, if he wanted to, could take over the world, um, but doesn't. He just wants to do the right thing. Um, um, and he's humble about it. Um, I'm trying to think, who else? I, I mean, I love Milestone Media Comics from the 1990s. A lot of y'all probably won't know them, but it was a black-owned company um, that came up with a, a multicultural, diverse uh, cast of characters in a fictional city um, called Dakota. And I love those characters so much. Um, yeah, I'd love to touch some of that stuff. Okay. Um, and here we are at the end of Black History Month. Yeah. So in five, ten years, when we're looking back on the past, I guess, year and a half, what do you think Black Panther will mean um, in black culture? I think one of the important things, uh, one of the important um, consequences of Black Panther becoming this global phenomenon is it got black people from different communities to talk to each other and think about what's shared and what's different. You know, I, I'm, I'm Haitian American. My parents immigrated here in the late 60s, early 70s. And, um, you know, we had Jamaican neighbors growing up. And my mom was like, yeah, I don't know about them. I'm like, mom, we're all from, you know, the same roots. But you think, you think about those roots put you, in, because of the circumstances of history and things like slavery and the Middle Passage and colonialism, you wind up experiencing and creating different kinds of blacknesses, right? You know, you come from a Nigerian, West African background, and you know, we have commonalities between the Caribbean and, 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 and uh, West African cultural practices, but there are also differences. And I think that's fascinating to, to think about the connections and the fractures, you know? And I think Black Panther enabled people throughout the black diaspora to, you know, engage in discourse, you know? Some of it was, you know, salty. Um, but, but I think uh, it was all um, edifying because, you know, there's, there's a constant struggle about um, black culture being portrayed on a massive scale. It gets portrayed as monolithic, like we all like the same things, we all do, the, like, it's not, it's not actually the, not the case, you know? Like, you know, uh, 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 food from one place is different from food from another place, you know? Um, and uh, all that stuff, um, there, you know, there's a cultural specificity that um, has to grow in different soil because of the different places uh, people in the diaspora have wound up. And that's fascinating to me. And I feel like Black, Black Panther um, had a little bit of that in the text of the movie itself, but like really the conversations around the movie, um, you know, uh, were fascinating in that regard. You know, people were, were dressing up in traditional African dress uh, to see the movie when it came right, out, right? Yeah. But then, then people are like, well, if you're from East Africa, it's like this. If you're from West Africa, like it's like this. And you know, you, you learn about that stuff, you know, because of the, the moment that the movie provided. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, you know, thinking about the black diaspora in a broader spectrum, um, a more varied spectrum, um, is I think one of the things that we'll, we'll think about as a consequence of this movie. And then before we get to audience questions, most of our crowd today is made up of high school students making important career decisions. Um, so as someone who has, I guess, made it in a field that you are passionate about, that you care about, what is a lesson you've learned that you wish you knew um, starting out? This is gonna sound a little bit corny, but keep doing it. Like, especially as concerns writing, you know, you may, you may think about it as being drudgery, right? Like, oh, I, you know, it's homework, it's a project, it's my final paper. But you know, those opportunities where you are compelled to, to do that kind of stuff, you know, are actually moments where you can have fun. You know, like, I, it's funny, I went to the attic of, of my place uh, a week ago, and I found some of my old college papers, and I was like, like looking at one eye, kind of wincing. And I was like, oh wait, this wasn't as bad as I remembered. Like I actually made a joke in this paper. I, like I had, you know, like, and the, and the teacher got it. He wrote a little note to the side, like good one. And you know, like it was stuff I had to turn in for a grade, but it was also, you know, if you are following your passion, you know, and you always can, especially in something like writing, right? Like you may have an assignment about some boring, dusty old history figure, right? But like you can make it come alive in a way that um, interest you, and you know, follow that. You know, there there are a lot of years where my mom wanted me to be a lawyer, so I thought writing was going to be done, 
and I started, spent a lot of time studying constitutional law, and I'm like, this is not it for me. Um, uh, but, and I let writing fall by the wayside. Um, so I wish I had kept on writing, um, um, even when I didn't have to, writing for myself um, or writing for uh, you know, my friends. Um, so you know, if there's something you feel like you want to do, like stick with it. Like don't let um, discouragement um, stop you from following what you feel like your passion is. Because uh, you know, I have friends of mine. I was telling Dan this uh, uh, earlier. No, it wasn't you. It was actually somebody last night. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but I have friends of mine who are doctors and lawyers and architects. And you know what? They make more money than me. But I've never been miserable a day in my life in my job. Um, I've always done what I've loved, um, um, and I've managed to, you know, wind up in some pretty cool places as a result of it. Um, so follow your passion. Don't don't let it drop, um, despite what other people might say. Hello, I'm Hilal Valuk, a sophomore from Solon High School, and today we're listening to a forum with Evan Narciss, a journalist, critic, and author of The Rise of the Black Panther. He's in conversation with former Youth Forum Council President Tiolu Orasanya. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, city club members, guests, students, or those joining us via our live stream. If you would like to tweet your question, please tweet it to City Club Youth and we'll ask as time allows. We ask that your questions be brief to the point and actual questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, raise your hand and our microphone holders will come to you. Holding microphones today are Youth Forum Council members Lauren Shepherd and Maria Kondratova. May we first have the first question, please. Hi, um, I work for an immigration lawyer, so what you said about being from an immigrant family interested me. Uh, could you talk a little bit about your family and how that affected your point of view? Oh, sure. Um, I got this one ready. Um, so my parents are Haitian, um, and uh, uh, the thing about being Haitian is that you grew up with a lot of pride. Um, Haiti was the first uh, free black, black Republic, which means they were the first country to successfully revolt against colonialism. Um, um, they became independent in 1804. And um, what you might know about Haiti from you know, the stereotypes pushed in, 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 in news coverage and in, in mainstream media, we're poor, you know, it's, it's a country where life is hard, but it's also a country with beautiful culture. Um, and it made history. Uh, so we always had pride. And when I was writing um, Rise of the Black Panther and thinking about, you know, what is the, 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 the mindset of a typical Wakandan person? And I was like, it's probably Haitian times a thousand, right? Because they never got conquered or colonized. So they really think they're the, the, the best people on earth. Um, plus they have all this advanced technology. And the pride that I, that, that, that my, I watched my mom and dad demonstrate um, um, as Haitian people outside of Haiti um, when they had to suffer under, you know, the stereotypes that other people want to box them into, um, that pride allowed me, you know, remembering that pride and how that felt, and then my, my own kind of moments of um, resisting stereotypes. Uh, when I was in high school, um, the AIDS crisis was in full swing, and there was a moment where um, uh, they didn't want to take blood from Haitian people because uh, supposedly it was more likely to be, uh, that population was more likely to be infected with AIDS. Um, and I marched, you know, my mom was a nurse and a bunch of her nurse friends, you know, went, there were marches in Brooklyn, and I marched, you know, to be, to be seen as a full human being, not a stereotype, not a danger, not a hazard. And um, it was that kind of pride that I was able to, to, to kind of like pull, pull out of the reservoir of my own life experience and use it to kind of make Wakanda feel real. Um, um, you know, Haitians like to argue about politics. And I put that, some of that in the comic too. So yeah, in a very real way, my immigrant experience, knowing what it's like to be framed in a context not of your own choosing, um, 
I put that, I was able to put that in, in the, my writing experience. After, um, I've heard that this is a sequel of the Black Panther, so I was trying to ask, is this going after Thanos and the Avengers Affinity Warfare after they had their war, or after the Black Panther when it ended? So I can't tell you what happens in the movie, <laughs> because I don't know. Um, the stories in the comics and the movies are different. Um, so the history in the comics is a little bit different. Um, this is kind of telling the same story as the, as the movie, but with different characters. The way I always like to talk about it is, you know, Marvel Comics back in the day, they signed uh, the rights for a lot of different characters, lots of studios, right? So like uh, 20th Century Fox has a Fantastic Four, right? And Doctor Doom is a Fantastic Four villain, right? So uh, he could never be in the movies with the Avengers, right? But since I'm writing comics, I can put Doctor Doom and Black Panther in the same comic. The same thing with uh, Namor and the Submariner, who's in issue two. So I, I always say I got to use all the toys. Um, so if you want to see what it looks like for T'Challa, you know, to go up all, against all these different characters that he may or may not meet in the movies, you want to read that. Hi, um, thank you. I'm Katie Scott, teacher at Hawkins School. Thanks for having us Hi, today. Katie. We thank love you for coming being to City Club. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the intentionality behind the matriarchy um, that seems to support the patriarchy. Um, yeah. And how that sort of intersects with uh, other goals of anti-colonialism, sure. black pride. Because my attention was sort of split in the movie. I yeah. was going, the, the, the matriarchy, patriarchy, but at the same time, the other. So what's behind that? So one of the things you have to realize about comic book histories is that they're long, complicated, quilt-like streams, right? So, you know, Stanley and Jack Kirby create this character in 1961, 62. And you know, Don McGregor is a writer who fleshed out uh, Wakanda and T'Challa's world in the 1970s, and then he kind of lays fallow for the 80s. Uh, there was a miniseries by Peter V. Gillis, which was great, drawn by Dennis Cohen. I'm being a full-on nerd here. I'm not going to stop. 1990s. <laughs> the 1990s uh, is when the idea of the Dora Milaje and General Okoye and those characters really, really comes about. Um, so it's kind of a postmodern, latter-day idea injected into something that had already been established as a mostly a patriarchy, mostly a monarchy, right? Um, so what happens is you have friction between those um, elements from different decades and different sensibilities, right? Um, I think, to me, that's one of the great things about making comics, because you can step in as a writer and have it make sense, exploit those tensions. Um, you know, there's, that, that 1980s miniseries, Black Panther miniseries I mentioned, uh, basically the, the main story is the Panther God abandoning T'Challa because, hey, you know, you're right next door to this country that, that we can't call South Africa, but is South Africa, and they have this whole apartheid thing going on. Why ain't you doing anything about that? I'm gonna put these superpowers in somebody else's body. And T'Challa's like, what's up? I thought I was the Black Panther, and I kinda still am, but not so much anymore. Um, so, you know, here's a character created in the 60s, when apartheid was active, but you, nobody spoke about it. And then in the 80s, you have a storyline dealing directly with apartheid. Um, so I think those tensions are always going to show up in characters which have been around for decades. Um, that said, you know, one of the things that's most interesting about Ta-Nehisi's Black Panther comics is his first story arc is about moving uh, uh, Wakanda from being a monarchy to a constitutional monarchy. So, um, and the Dora Milaje, who are the, 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 the female warrior characters that you're talking about, um, are a large part of that happening. So, I think um, the movie, like the comics over the years, is responding, is trying to serve two different goals, right? You know, honoring the publishing history uh, that's been established, but also responding to the current cultural moment, you know? Um, and I, I'm glad with how they did it. Uh, I think the soul, the moral soul of that movie lives in General Okoye, the character played by Denai Guerrera. You know, she has to serve, on, uh, honor the purpose of her station, which is serving the king, while also directly in conflict with what's best for the country in a moment of crisis. Um, I think that's fascinating. Um, and to leave you with one little hopeful nugget, uh, in the comics history, um, Shuri does become the Black Panther. She becomes the, the ruler of the nation. Um, uh, so 
we don't know whether Marvel's going to do that in the movies, but there's, there's, there's precedent for it in the comics. Hello, my Hi. name is Normante. I attend JSCCA. Um, my question is, what was you more excited to see, the Black Panther or Muhammad Ali be Superman in the comics? Ha, ah, that's a good one. Man, <laughs> let me tell you something. That's Superman versus Muhammad Ali comic. Again, I was probably y'all's age, um, maybe a little bit younger, was everything to me. I was a nerd, I was skinny, I did not have sports heroes. Like, it was, I was unathletic and uncoordinated and largely still am. Um, but my sports heroes were Reggie Jackson and Muhammad Ali. And, you know, as, when you're a kid, you're like, you know, if you even the odds, of course Muhammad Ali can take Superman. Um, um, one of the jokes that old school comic book nerds like to throw around is that Superman doesn't know how to fight. He's just strong. You know, he never boxed. Batman, you know, could be like, what's up? Uh, let's uh, shoot a fair one and let's see who comes out on top. Um, um, and that's what happens in that comic. Muhammad Ali fights Superman on even terms. And, you know, Ali wins. Uh, so that was great. But, you know, that was a one shot. You know, uh, seeing Black Panther stories throughout my entire lifetime, from when I was a kid to now, I probably takes the cake. But that Muhammad Ali comic is uh, uh, an, an, an amazing feat. Um, yeah. Good question. Thank you. Hello. Um, my Hi. name is Vance. I'm a creative writing student at Cleveland School of the Arts. And I want to ask you, do you think 100 years down the line, society would have evolved to the point where people no longer get discriminated against just for being who they are? Or will the hate continue to be passed down through generations? And as writers, what do you think we can do to combat, combat mm. this? Man, that's deep. Um, you know, it's funny. Growing up a science fiction fan, you know, you watch stuff like Star Trek, and that's, you know, hundreds, thousands of years in the future, and humanity gets along unto itself, but other races don't. Um, and science fiction, science fiction is great uh, for metaphor. I mean, look, we are in the year 2019, uh, hundreds of years after American independence, right? Um, hundreds of years after, you know, the first, uh, chattel slaves are, are arrived on the, the North American continent. Um, the unfortunate um, reality we live in is that these power systems erected under white supremacy self-perpetuate because certain people benefit from it, right? And the people who benefit from them are going to want these systems to stay in place for as long as possible. Um, 100 years doesn't feel like enough time. And I have a kid, and that sucks because, you know, I don't want her to live under a system like the one um, uh, we're operating under now. But as a writer, um, especially of fiction, you can critique that system. You can, um, you can bear witness to what it's like to exist under that system. You can bring light and focus and energy and inspiration to people who are on the fringes, um, who uh, live lives under different levels of disenfranchisement. Um, and, and that's super important. You know, uh, writers, especially of fiction, especially of science fiction, can imagine better realities. And um, that's important because living life day to day under systems that are unfair or oppressive um, blunts your ability to imagine. And, um, you know, the imagination is where um, movements uh, f for freedom and social justice start. You know, uh, the Black Panthers had to imagine the idea of free back breakfast programs, you know, and voter registration under, under, under a system that did not want either of those things to exist for, for the people they were helping. So it, it, it starts in your imagination. So your job as a writer will be to give voice to your own imagination and help other people find theirs, because that's where change starts. As we move to the next question, I just have to say I love your glasses. They're very nice. OK. Hi, um, I'm Allison Taylor from CLA, Students' Leadership Academy. And I would like to know, how did you end up uh, introducing Zuri to the comics? So 
Zuri is not, uh, Shuri's not my creation. One of the great things, also challenging things about comics is, um, you know, dozens of people, if not hundreds, have written this character, these stories before me. Um, Shuri was created by Reginald Hudlin, um, who's a film producer and a comic book writer, and a run of Black Panther comics that started in, in 2005. Um, uh, and she been, she's been in the comics ever since. The hard thing for me was, I'm old, so I was, I've been reading Black Panther comics since way before Shuri was created. And when it sat down for me to think about how do I write this character, I was like, I don't know. Because I've been reading T'Challa, you know, ever since I was a kid. I'm like, all right, I get him. I know where he's coming from, right? But her, I was like, uh, I was already grown up when I, uh, when I encountered her. I don't know how I feel about this. But the fun thing about writing her character was, well, I had to think about it um, with my own siblings. I have a younger sister. And what was our relationship like? Like, yeah, she was kind of annoying. And you know, she was also better at certain things than I was. She's a bet I'm the only member of my family that can dance. Like my brother can dance, my sister can't can dance, I can't dance. And you know, they would always tease me about that. Uh, um, so you I use that as a as a window to think about the kind of relationship that T'Challa and Shuri would have, right? She's better at certain certain things than he is, and she would, you know, give him guff about it. Uh, uh, what's funny is I was writing this series without any knowledge of what the movie script was, what was happening in the movie. So um, when the movie comes out, I'm like, hey, they, they wound up in the same place, which is kind of natural, right? You know, if you have brothers and sisters, you know you make, you, you tease each other and give each other grief, but you also support each other. Um, so, uh, you know, I think Shuri's a great character because she can be so multifaceted. You know, in some stories, she's the gen scientific genius, like in the movie. In other stories, she's like a spy. Um, and a queen, um, and I think you know her character shows how broad you can make these fictions so that anybody can fit in. You know, it does you know dudes? It's not just dudes who are going to be the Black Panther. Of course, it's been women throughout history too, and I think um, Shuri's a great character um, to represent that. Uh, here, Christian. Hey. Hi. Um, so I'm a not geo photographer, and so my. I'm, I'm going to try to give you a, a part A, part B question. Okay. The first one is, um, I'm also a father of two, te one teenager, one ten-year-old, and we do have all these. We do have real conversations, back-to-back -back debates about identity. Yeah. And you, and you did say that there is a struggle within the fan base whenever they change the yes. characters. Yeah. But you also said you didn't identify with with certain characters because yeah. of how far you were. That's, that's one. And quickly, as an educator also, how close do you think, and, I, and I'm so happy to see so many people that look like me in this, in this conference right now. So am I. Huge. Right. And so let's speak to that. How close did Black Panther take us to the continent? I mean, you know, we can't ignore the fact that, you know, this is a production that comes from, like, a giant company, right? Um, and and they're gonna probably gonna be. They have a needle to thread, right? You know, it's not gonna be the same as if it was a, a, a independently funded Spike Lee production from like 1990, right? It's gonna feel different. Um, but you know, I feel like again, Ruth Carter, Hannah Beachler, Ryan Coogler, Joe Robert Cole, the co-screenwriter, like you know, I've spoken to some of these people, and they had all these concerns in mind, right? They're like, okay, we exist in so many different facets and modes all over the planet. Let's try and get as much of that in as we can, you know? Um, you know, the, what they did with Killmonger alone is beautiful. Like, uh, uh, again, the subtext that was always there in that character, you're somebody from the continent that got ripped away, grew up somewhere else, and, and being away from your homeland and your history and your culture, you know, broke your psyche. Um, um, it's a beautiful metaphor that is, that is also painful. Uh, so I know that these concerns were there um, um, for the people that made the movie, and it's, al it's also been there for people who've been making these comics too. Um, you know, and the, other, the first part of your question, like these characters exist throughout time. You know, the way people wrote Superman in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and today is much different. You know, he was like a lot more conservative. He became like a father figure in the 1950s. Um, whereas now he's kind of like, he's back to being a father, but it's a different kind of father, right? Um, and you know, Black Panther is the same way. You know, uh, uh, 
one of the things I had to think about in writing this story was an unilluminated moment in the comics history, which is, you know, at some point they had to start dealing with the outside world, you know, and uh, they had been a traditionally isolationist country, um, and that was prevented as a kind of a virtue. Um, but to my way of thinking, in a moment where we're living in the United States of America, which cre seems to be creeping dangerously close to a new kind of isolationism, I want to write a story that, that, that talked about why separating yourself off from the rest of the world could be dangerous. Um, so, you know, Shuri's a character I didn't grow up with. I grew to love. Um, and, you know, uh, hopefully my version of these characters is something that people will love um, from their youth into their adulthood. But they're, they're always changing. It's one of the beautiful things about comic book characters. They, they keep on morphing as, as time goes on. And I think the more interpretations they are able to support, the, the stronger and more vibrant they are. And that includes characters like Captain America and Thor and whatnot. You know, like if Thor is a character about, that's at its core, it's about like, hey, are you worthy to wield the power of a god? Well then, who are we to say that just one kind of person can do that. Anybody can lift that hammer if, they're, if, they, if they act right. Um, so, yeah. How are we on time? We have 10, yeah. seven issues. Okay, let's do it. Fast questions, we're in lightning round now. Uh, my name's Asim. Uh, what do you think made the movie Black Panther more impactful than like the series or the comics? Whoa, um, I resemble that remark. Um, well, I mean, in a very basic level, there's a difference of scale, right? You know, like comic books only come out, in, but in so many comic shops and, and bookstores, a movie is an event, right? Um, I think a lot of what made the movie great comes from the comics. You know, like uh, the Dora Milaje, General Okoye, those are all characters from the comics. Um, I think the, the the thing that the movie did was find different facets of these characters that are, that are interesting. Um, you know, Killmonger is, again, a great example of how, what they changed from the comics. When he first shows up in the comics, he just like, he's like, hey, I've been living outside of Wakanda. T'Challa, can I, can you, can you, I, I come home? He's like, sure. And next thing you know, he's like, oh, I just bought this guy who's all messed up in the head back to, back to the country that he's trying to overthrow my reign. Um, what the movie does um, is show how he got into that mindset. And, um, you know, again, I, I had the same ambitions and I did them in a different way in, this, in the comic book. Um, but that just shows you that, like, the idea of somebody who comes from a place that is almost perfect, yet is so imperfect himself, is really impactful. So I feel like they took, they took the themes of the comics and made them big and broad um, and, made, and blew them up in a way that made a giant spectacle. And you know, it's cool to watch two dudes fight on a waterfall, you know, like in real time. It's, it's cool to read it in the comics, but like, when you, like, oh, he actually might fall off that cliff. It wasn't a real cliff. But to see those moments makes it feel like grand and operatic and larger than life. And I think that's something the movie did really well. Hi, I Hi. am uh, Matthew Mardrum. I'm a theater major from the Cleveland School of the Arts. Uh, one of my dreams is to become an actor. But the other dream I have is to write for uh, black superheroes and even black villains, which I think are, um, aren't as represented. What's up? Um, so yeah, like, like Miles Morales. And so the question I had was, were you surprised by the amount of support that Black Panther, the movie, um, got from all groups of people? That was my, that was my question. Nah, I wasn't. Um, you know, uh, the second time I saw Black Panther was at a, um, advanced screening that, that members of the press got to go to. And a friend of mine um, bought his girlfriend who uh, was of Filipino background. And you know, one of the things I like to say is like, I've cried, I cry every time I watch this movie. Um, even though I know what's gonna happen, I know the whole thing, I know when the music, dun -dun 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 -dun, I know when all that stuff is gonna happen, uh, but it still gets me every time. And we, we had finished coming out, of that, come out of that screening and I was talking about how like, yeah, it's my second time and it still gets me. Um, and she's like, yeah, it got me too. And she comes from a totally different cultural background than me. And one of the things I realized is that um, uh, if you come from somewhere else, um, you, you, have a, you have a history and a culture that um, doesn't get represented fairly or fully, and you see a movie that attempts to show 
a fuller portrait of what humanity looks like um, with people who look like you, like that gets you. Like, you know, and I've had people f from all walks of life, you know, talk about their experiences, about seeing the movie and feel like, oh, you know, you know, so often the image we see, images we see of, of people from marginalized groups, and let's use black people as an example, you know, are, are uh, come through the, the lens of focusing on pain and struggle and strife. And that makes good drama, but the thing that makes Black Panther really amazing is it's about black glory and black excellence. It's about, hey, you know what? If nobody was messing with us throughout history, here's what we could accomplish. And I think that's a really powerful, powerful statement, creative statement. Round of applause for Mr. Narcisse. Okay, am I applauding myself? Okay. No, I think we're done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm Lin Zhao Kyu, a junior at Solon High School and a member of the Youth Forum Council. And today we have been listening to the forum with Evan Narcis, a journalist, critic, and author of the Rise of the Black Panther. He's in conversation with uh, former Youth Forum Council President Tiolu Orasanya. All City Club Youth Forums are sponsored by AT&T. We're delighted to have Nikki Jaworski with us today. Thank you for your continued support of our student programming. Today's forum is also part of our Authors in Conversation series supported in part by the residents of the Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We are grateful to all of the residents of Cuyahoga County for their support through that public grant. We welcome students from A.J. Rickoff School, Andrew Osborne Academy, Bard High School Early College, Cleveland Citizens Leadership Academy, Cleveland School of the Arts, Hawkins School, John Adams High School, Lutheran High School East, M.C. Squares Dem High School, St. Martin de Pores High School, Shaw High School, and Washington Park Environmental Studies Academy. Support for the students' participation in City Club forums comes from Key Bank and the William M. Weiss Foundation, with additional support from the donors you'll find listed in today's program. We thank you all for being here today. The sale of Evan Narset's book, uh, Rise of the Black Panther, is provided by a cultural exchange. And that brings us to the end of today's forum. Thank you, Mr. Narcis and Ms. Orasanya. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. The forum is now adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.